Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us uh, for our uh, Grand Rounds this morning, which focuses on colorectal cancer. Uh, this is part of a series of three, and we are um, uh, on Grand Rounds number two. The first was on the 3rd of November, and uh, we discussed breast cancer. And uh, on the uh, 1st of December coming up, we will discuss lung cancer. But today, our focus is colorectal cancer. One of the things we were talking about just prior uh, to opening the uh, conference was uh, that you will hear a focus not just on age-based screening, but on risk-based screening. We'll probably talk more about that during the panel. So let me introduce our guests. First, Dr. Devi, uh, Devi Krishnamurthy, uh, got that right, um, uh, is an associate professor and chief of colorectal surgery at Creighton University School of Medicine in Omaha. Her areas of interest include surgical education, patient safety, and healthcare quality improvement in the clinical setting. Next, we have Dr. Ron Galliano, uh, who is a professor of surgery and chairman of the Department of Surgery for the Dignity Health Medical Group, Group Arizona. He is the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Oncology for the Dignity Health Cancer Institute at St. Joseph's. He serves as the Southwest Division Physician Leader on the National Executive Council of the CSH Oncology Institute. And he is also an associate board member of the um, American Board of Colorectal uh, Surgery. And also joining us this morning uh, is our friend, Dr. Peter Emanuel, who uh, has been on all, who will be on all of these calls. Uh, he is uh, known as an internationally renowned oncologist and leading researcher uh, of adult and pediatric forms of, leuke of leukemia. He joined St. Vincent's in 2008 uh, at the oncology program there. Uh, he previously worked at the University of Arkansas uh, for medical services, where he was director of the Winthrop P. Rockefeller Cancer Center. In May of 2022, he was named as the system vice president for the Oncology Clinical Institute for Common Spirit Health. So welcome all. Uh, thank you. Uh, John has put the CME information in the chat, and I think we'll start. Uh, who is going to start? Is it Ron? Are you? Oh, oh, okay, Debbie. Okay, uh, here we go. All right, next slide. So it gives me great pleasure today to be talking about colorectal cancer. Both Dr. Galliano and I are passionate about it. And the why is because colorectal cancer is the third leading cause of U.S. cancer death. So if we have to believe the American Cancer Society's estimates, in 2023, there will be 153,000 new cases and 52,600 deaths. That accounts for 7.8% of all cancer diagnosis and 8.6% of all cancer deaths from um, in the year 2023. And as you know, colorectal cancer is most frequently diagnosed in the age of 65 to 74, but it's also important to remember that 10.5% of all new colorectal cancer diagnoses occur at the age less than 50. So that's why we bring the focus to our younger patients today. Let's go to the next slide. And we all know screening improves survival. According to the CDC, if uh, the screening rate uh, has to be evaluated between the year 2000 and 2019, we see an improvement from 42% to 68%. Now we are nowhere that we need to be, but it's at least better than what it used to be. Between 1976 and 2014, due to the improvement in screening specifically, the incidence of colorectal cancer has decreased from approximately 60.5 per 100,000 to 38.6 per 100,000. If you were to evaluate the mortality between the years 1990 to 2007, the mortality from colorectal cancer has decreased by 35%. Our hope is one day we will get to zero. Next slide. So if we look at the modeling, about 63% of colorectal cancers in the United States are due to non-screening. So if we were to increase the screening rates to 80%, compared to 60 where we are right now. Um, and if that were improved by 2018, the cancer predicted would have improved 
by preventing about 280,000 new colorectal cancer cases and 200,000 colorectal cancer deaths by 2030. So it's really important to improve screening rates so survival can be better. As you all know, most patients that are diagnosed with colorectal cancers are asymptomatic. Next slide. So as we know, the survival with colorectal cancer worsens with advanced stages. So in patients that are diagnosed with early stage colorectal cancer, when this disease is localized, the five-year survival is 91%. As we progress to patients with distant metastatic disease, the survival at five years is 13%. So it's not only important to prevent colorectal cancer, but also diagnose these at early stages. And overall, the survival with colorectal cancers is about 63%. Next slide. So let's go to a case-based question. Next. So let's uh, imagine a 45-year-old who presents for an annual exam and tells you that they have several months of stool caliber changes, occasionally painless, bright red blood per rectum, and you examine them and you see no hemorrhoids. What is the best option for this patient? Is it A, a fecal immunochemical test, B, a multi-targeted stool DNA test, C, a CT colonography, or D, diagnostic evaluation? We'll give everyone a minute for the vote. All right, let's see what the right answer is. Next slide. So that's great. 79% of you pick the right choice, which is this patient has symptoms, so they need to be referred for a diagnostic evaluation. Next. So let's review what are the symptoms that are concerning for colorectal cancer. So in patients with colorectal cancer, most of them are asymptomatic, but if they did have symptoms, they would have iron deficiency anemia, rectal bleeding, changes in bowel habits, or unexplained weight loss. Now, it's very important to know that these individuals need to be referred promptly for a diagnostic evaluation. These are not the patients we are talking about today when we talk about screening. Screening is for asymptomatic patients, so we just want to make that clear. Next slide. So again, to reiterate, if the question to ask is if there are any symptoms, if there are no symptoms, then we are going to talk about screening. If there are symptoms, regardless of age, regardless of when the prior colonoscopy was performed, they need a diagnostic evaluation. I'm going to turn this uh, over to my co-panelist, Dr. Galliano, now for the next slide. Thank you. We'll begin with our second case-based question. A well 40-year-old presents for an annual exam where you assess their risk of colorectal carcinoma. Which of the following is a criteria for increased risk of colorectal cancer? Okay, let's see what our poll shows. And obviously this is a clear, uh, not less clear um, question or answer for our group. It's answer is actually B, abdominal chemotherapy and radiation therapy as a child. This question was designed to highlight some of the new uh, changes to uh, risk-based uh, categorization of our patients. Next slide. So in our algorithm, trying to figure out who is at average risk for colorectal screening is actually done in an inverted way. We first ask if there is signs of high risk uh, family history or individually known risk in the patient. If not, do we have increased risk? And increased risk is not having a personal history of an adenoma or sesulcerated polyp or lesion or a personal history of colorectal carcinoma, a personal history of inflammatory bowel disease, and as stated, or a high risk or familial genetic syndrome, a personal history of cystic fibrosis, or a personal history of childhood cancer, specifically if chemotherapy 
and or radiation therapy were provided uh, to the patient's uh, abdomen or pelvis. In family history, um, colorectal cancer in first, second, or third degree relatives now confer or are understood to confer risk in their different schema, which Dr. Krishnamurthy will go through later in the talk. If it, there is an advanced adenoma in the first degree, and this should be pathologically uh, confirmed, it's a, an advanced adenoma is defined as any adenoma with high grade dysplasia greater than or equal to one centimeter in size, any component of villus histology on pathology, so that'll be villus or tubular villus, or if it's an advanced sessile serrated polyp or lesion, meaning it's greater than one centimeter or any form of dysplasia in a sessile serrated lesion. So that's different than an adenoma where it's only high grade dysplasia. All adenomas are presumed to be low grade uh, dysplasia, have this low grade dysplasia and are called out only if their dysplasia is high grade. Next slide. So the types of average risk screening mortality can be broken down into three categories. There are stool-based tests, tests that directly visualize the uh, polyps and lining of the colon and indirect imaging or radiographic. So we break that out into fecal occult blood test, fecal immunohistochemical test or multi-target stool DNA. For the stool-based tests, direct visualization is colonoscopy. And now FlexSig is actually back into the mix for average risk screening modalities. And CT colonography, where available, uh, is a very specific protocol with specific software to help uh, identify those lesions. Next slide. We look at our average risk screening modalities. There are um, these are the tests, and then you look in the second column and it says recommended testing interval. These are assuming the tests are negative for um, cancer or an adenoma, and that's the interval by which the, the repeat testing is done. The sensitivity and specificities for colon cancer, um, advanced adenomas, and uh, then specificities for each are listed. Um, as a result of this data, our current guidelines that we're working on are recommending either a FIT or a multi-target stool DNA for a stool assessment, if that's chosen by the provider and the patient with shared decision-making. Um, CT uh, colonography uh, is um, an option for people who do not wish to undergo um, a colonoscopy, but may want more than a stool-based study. And uh, of colonoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy, um, the recommendation from our group is colonoscopy would be the preferred uh, direct imaging uh, modality for average risk patients. What we're providing this data for is because in average risk, unless you're having a proceduralist do a test like a flexig or colonoscopy for you, you have to understand what the recommended repeat interval is based off of your findings. And then in um, all tests other than colonoscopy, if a test is positive, the next step is referral for a colonoscopy. Next slide. Uh, one of the considerations, and this should come from your procedural list, is what do we do if we have an inadequate prep or an incomplete colonoscopy? Um, with an uh, a inadequate prep, uh, repeating within one year, or screening with another modality is indicated. Again, assuming that this is a average risk uh, patient, if it's incomplete, specifically if um, you find a uh, advanced adenoma but can't complete the procedure for whatever reason, less than one year. Previous guidelines had recommended within two to six months. Current guidelines repeat recommend repeating within one year. Next slide. Okay, case-based question number three. A 40-year-old presents with a, for, to establish care as a new patient. Family history reveals a sibling diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. Which is the best option? So which test in a Lynch cohort patient? And our panel 
So yeah. So this is a probably a little bit of a tough distractor, but we recommend referring to a genetic counselor and a high skilled risk screening program. Uh, in high risk syndromes, Lynch being an example, there are multiple uh, structures at risk. So from a pure colon screening standpoint, colonoscopy is a reasonable option. However, these patients are probably best managed with understanding their risks of general urinary GI tract, uh, you know, upper tract lesions, and obviously uh, the, the, the gynecologic malignancies in women. Best done in referral to a genetic counselor and then a team that's going to manage the whole complexity of the patient. So that's what we're trying to get people to think of in these type of scenarios. Next uh, slide. So for the components of our high risk guideline, next slide. We say the discussion at the beginning, a patient comes in, do they have signs and symptoms? If it's yes, as Dr. Krishna Murthy said, we would send a person straight to uh, diagnostic evaluation. If not, then the next group would be looking for high risk uh, family history. If there is, then as you see, we talked about referred genetic counseling and then a uh, gastroenterologist, colorectal surgeon or high risk uh, clinic evaluation that can manage the entirety of the patient. Next slide. When looking at our high risk or fam familial uh, genetic syndromes for colorectal cancer, you can break them up into two categories. One of them is the polyposis syndromes. So polyposis meaning there's multiple polyps. The prototypical example of that is classic familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP. Uh, that's the hundred to thousands of polyps in the colon at a time. Uh, attenuated FAP, which is tens to hundreds of polyps. Uh, then there are other uh, polyposis that might be in the tens to twenties like MAP or M-U-Y-T-H associated puth juvenile polyposis, serrated polyposis, or all polyposis syndromes. Cowden syndrome is a hamartomatous polyp syndrome, but this is an example of why uh, this should be best done in a high-risk clinic setting or people who really understand it, because the real risk in Cowden syndrome is, is given enough time, nearly 100% of people are going to develop breast cancer. So there are other structures, sarcomas, whatnot. Um, and, and we were trying to make an, an emphasis on getting the whole patient taken care of, not just the colon. For our non-polyposis syndromes, what we want to point out about this is this is not non-polyp. These patients still make polyps, but they generally don't present with polyposis over the course of time. And that would be Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal carcinoma uh, syndrome and uh, Lee Fraumeni. Next slide. So for our guidelines for these type of patients, it's tailored surveillance with risk-reducing procedures based on the individual syndromes. For example, Lynch syndrome patients should be uh, screened around 25 years or two to five years prior to the youngest cohort that has colorectal cancer and repeated every one to two years. The polyp to carcinoma sequence in Lynch tends to run every three years, where in terms of other syndromes the, or sporadic colorectal carcinoma, so the polyp the carcinoma sequence ranges about 10 years. Um, in an FAP or AFAP, it's usually an annual colonoscopy starting between 10 to 15 years. It's easier when the patient is not the index patient of the uh, genetic mutation to understand how the family tends to present its uh, polyps and then cancer. Just remember the high-risk patients have other systems that need to be evaluated as well. Next slide. So who should be screened for genetic syndromes that otherwise you would think about would be patients that have greater than or equal to 10 adenomas polyps and or sessile serrated polyps lesion in a single colonoscopy, or patients over the course of their screening time have more than 20 cumulative adenomas polyps and or sessile serrated polyps lesions. This is a grouped under a term called colonic polyposis of uncertain etiology. These type of patients um, can be insidious because it might be five adenomas at a time, but once you've had four, you know, every three years, uh, you have to you get the cumulative polyp load to understand that these patients may have something and deserve uh, an evaluation by genetic counseling at high risk. And anyone with uh, colorectal cancer less than 50 years of age, regardless of their um, MMR uh, proficient or deficient status. Next slide. 
and we'll turn it back over to Dr. Krishnamurthy. Thank you, Dr. Kaliano. So we have looked at the people with the average risk and then the people with the high risk in the guidelines uh, thus far. So now we go to the population that's at increased risk. So they are not the average risk, they are not the high risk, they are somewhere in the middle. Next slide. So this is our common spirit algorithm for increased risk. So once you have evaluated these patients and they don't have symptoms, they don't fall into average risk or high risk, we come down to this part of our algorithm. And we will go through each of these one by one, but this is just to give you a visual of the map of what we are going to be talking about. Next slide. So the first group of patients that are at increased risk are people with personal history of polyps. Next slide. This is a very scary table. It goes through a lot of categories here. So don't get overwhelmed. Let's just move to the next slide. We will break it down into individual sections. So suppose you have a patient that has a colonoscopy, comes back with low-risk adenomas. Now, how do we define low-risk adenomas? This, these are patients that have either less than two polyps and those polyps are less than one centimeter in size. So the current guideline states that if you have two or fewer polyps and the polyps are less than a centimeter, we repeat the colonoscopy in seven to 10 years. Next slide. Now, if the patient has low risk, either sesylcerated polyp or lesion, and on the pathology, they say no dysplasia. And they, these are less than two in number or less than a centimeter in size. These patients require a repeat colonoscopy in five years. So if it's a tubular adenoma, we said seven to 10 years, but if this is a sulcerated polyp or lesion without dysplasia, it's five years. So that's clear. Let's move on to the next. So the next group is people with high risk. What are high risk? These are people with either advanced polyps or multiple polyps. So let's see what falls under the category of either advanced or multiple polyps. So these are patients with traditional serrated adenomas high-grade dysplasia, either cisalcerated polyp or lesion, but now with dysplasia, people with villus or tubulovillus histology, or three to nine adenomatous polyps, cisalcerated polyps, cisalcerated lesions. So if you have any of these categories present on the pathology result, and the patient asks you how often, we usually say repeat in, five, repeat in three years, and then if, depending on the repeat in three years, if, it, if that's negative, we still recommend repeat in five years. If it is positive, depending on what you find, then you can tailor the recommendation accordingly. Now, these are the high-risk polyps. Let's move on to the next slide and talk about the large polyps. When we say large, we usually mean more than a centimeter in size. So that's either an adenoma or cisalcerated polyp or lesion that's over a centimeter or even a hyperplastic polyp that's more than equal to a centimeter in size. So what do we do for these large polyps? Depends on whether they were removed endoscopically, whether the resection was piecemeal, whether the resection was complete. The recommendation is to follow up in six months to three years, depending on how it was resected. This is one category where a conversation with the gastroenterologist or the colorectal surgeon or the proceduralist who performed the colonoscopy would be important to identify what the risk would be based on how the polyp was removed. Next slide. Then we come to the category that's highest risk. This is where we kind of overlap with the high risk guidelines where we talked about the polyposis syndromes. These are patients with more than 10 adenomatous polyps or cisalcerated polyps or lesions in a single colonoscopy, or they have a lifetime cumulative greater than 20 adenomatous polyps, and or cisalcerated polyp or lesions over multiple colonoscopies. So for these patients with numerous polyps, we usually say colonoscopy in one year. And like Dr. Galliano pointed out, we consider whether they have a polyposis syndrome, so they need to be referred for genetic counseling and evaluation. Thank you for staying with me for this slide. Let's move on to the next category. So what about the patients with colitis? Next slide. So when we talk about colitis, with the risk factors for getting colorectal polyps and cancer, who are at the highest risk? So these are patients with either Crohn's colitis, which involves more than a third of the colon, ulcerative colitis, people with extensive colitis, colonic strictures, primary sclerosing cholangitis, 
patients with family history of colorectal cancers, especially if these colitis patients have family members who were diagnosed with cancer, colorectal cancer less than 50 years of age, people with long-standing inflammation. And for these patients, we recommend that screening starts at eight years after symptom onset. Now, remember, this is symptom onset, not the date of diagnosis, because sometimes these patients go years before they are diagnosed. So it really has to be teased as to when the symptom onset was so that you can start screening appropriately eight years from the onset of symptoms. Next slide. So what is the follow-up interval once you start at that eight years from symptom onset if your colonoscopy shows no dysplasia and on your colonoscopy, you deem them to be low risk and low risk is based on either endoscopic or histologic presence or absence of active inflammation. So if they are low risk and there's no active inflammation, we recommend follow-up in two to three years. But if you see dysplasia, or, I'm sorry, if you see no dysplasia and they are high risk, either because they have PSC, active inflammation, or a family history of colorectal cancer less than 50 years, then you recommend colonoscopy in one year. So if they have no dysplasia, but they are high risk, it's a yearly. If they have no dysplasia and low risk, it's two to three years. Now we come to those patients with dysplasia. Now, if you have col ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and you see dysplasia, now this is where your procedure list becomes very important because then the question is, what was the quality of the colonoscopy and how was that dysplasia diagnosed and whether that is visible or invisible? Just to keep this simple for this talk, I think in this case, a referral to an IBD specialist or a gastroenterologist or surgeon would be important. And these people should have expertise in inflammatory bowel disease to then tailor this recommendation as to whether this person should continue with surveillance or if they actually have to be referred for further surgical evaluation. So if any patients with colitis and dysplasia needs to be referred to an expert, but if they have no dysplasia, these are the guidelines. Let's move on to the next slide. Another risk category that's very important to know about is people with cystic fibrosis. Next slide. So in people with cystic fibrosis, they are at high risk of colo colorectal cancers and their screening guidelines are divided based on whether they have or have not received a solid organ transplant. In those patients with cystic fibrosis who have not received a solid organ transplant, we recommend starting colonoscopy at age 40. Those patients with cystic fibrosis who have received solid organ transplant, the guidelines suggest that colonoscopy should be started at age 30 or within two years of transplant if it was younger than that age. Now, how often do we repeat the colonoscopy in these uh, individuals? If the colonoscopy was normal, we repeat in five years. But if you find adenomas, cis-ulcerated polyps, and lesions, we repeat in three years, just understanding that these individuals are at higher risk than our average population. Next slide. So next category we talk about is uh, related to the question you all answered about childhood cancers. Next slide. So... When we say young onset, we include all childhood, adolescent, or young adult cancers. That's really cancers that were diagnosed at age less than 40. So if any patients have uh, this fall into this category, this would be the recommendation. And the recommendation is really uh, divided based on what kind of treatment was provided for people with these childhood, adolescent, or young adult cancers. So if these individuals were treated with chemotherapy and did not receive radiation therapy, Colonoscopy should be started at age 35 or 10 years after the age of chemotherapy, whichever occurs first. And once you start it at age 35, then you continue it every five years. The next category is people that had received radiation therapy and not just radiation anywhere, but specifically to their abdominal pelvic field or total body irradiation involving their abdomen, pelvis, spine, for these individuals, colonoscopy should be started at age 30 or five years after treatment, whichever occurs last. And then we should continue it every five years. For those individuals with childhood, adolescent or young adult cancer who did not receive chemotherapy or radiation, they fall into the same category as our average risk screening guidelines and start at age 45 and continue every 10 years in the absence of any findings. Next slide. 
why is this important? There's a newly di uh, or understood or recognized category known as therapy-associated polyposis. The, this is defined as cumulative incidence of greater than 10 GI polyps of any type, adenomas, cisulcerated lesions, hematomas, and these can be in any part of the GI tract. These individuals usually have a history of systemic therapy, either radiotherapy or uh, chemotherapy for a childhood young adult cancer, and specifically abdominal pelvic radiotherapy or alkylating chemotherapy. And these people with therapy-associated polyposis, usually when you uh, have them undergo multi-gene panel testing, they do not have any defined pathogenic variant. So the theory is that accumulated mutations from exposure to either radiation or alkylating chemotherapy re leads to polyposis. So these individuals need to be screened more frequently. Next slide. So let's come to the category of family history. This is where I think the most opportunity lies when we talk about screening guidelines, because um, now we talk not just about first degree, but also second and third degree relatives. Next slide. Thank you all for staying with me. This is just coming towards the end. So just bear with me with this busy slide again. We will work through this. For people with first degree relatives with colorectal cancers at any age, the recommendations are to start with colonoscopy beginning at age 40. But if the family member was younger than 50, then it should be 10 years before the diagnosis of colorectal cancer. So at age 40 or 10 years before the family member. And the recommendation is to repeat every five years or based on the colonoscopy findings. So all of those patients that come in with you know, family members, first degree relatives, the recommendation is to have them be referred for colonoscopy and the interval should be five, not 10 years. For people with second and third degree relatives with colorectal cancers at any age, colonoscopy should begin at age 45 or 10 years before the youngest relative's age of diagnosis, just like we talked about in the other category. And the repeat interval is at least every 10 years or based on the findings on your colonoscopy. Here we move on to the third category, which is also an exciting opportunity to capture more patients for screening is people with first degree relatives with now confirmed advanced adenomas. So not just cancers, but also advanced polyps. And how do we define these? These are patients with high grade dysplasia, polyps greater than a centimeter, with hillis villus or tubulovillus histology, traditional serrated adenomas, advanced sessile serrated polyp or lesions that is greater than a centimeter or with any dysplasia. If they have a first degree relatives with any of these bad features on their polyps at any age, colonoscopy should begin at age 40 or at the age of onset of adenoma in the relative, whichever is earlier. And then the recommendation is to repeat it every five to 10 years or based on the colonoscopy findings. Next slide. So now we move on to our panel discussion. Thank you so much for your patience. Hey, thank you so much. That was uh, quite the review and we so appreciate lots of details, lots of restructuring of how we think about colorectal cancer screening moving away from just age-based, but really taking into consideration all the different risk factors a patient may have. Um, as we get started, we're going to ask um, our audience members to please submit um, questions to us. We will be addressing them as we go. But first, Dr. Greenswick, I wanted to ask you um, to comment on some of the work that's been undergoing at the physician enterprise level to get us migrate us from the age-based only to that risk-based yes. approach. Right. There's two pieces to this. And I um, neglected to mention when we started that the Clinical Standards and Variation Reduction Group led by Dr. Sagar um, uh, has recently published uh, guidelines for uh, cancer screening that include uh, lung, breast, and colorectal. And so we've uh, sent those out to folks. If, if anyone does not have access to the link, please let us know. I believe it's also on the Physician Enterprise um, uh, Resource Library website. And I don't think we go quite into the depth of colorectal cancer screening that we did today, but I think there's good information. Uh, the one focus, and we talked about this a bit, 
uh, uh, during our pre-call is that in the day, which is not that long ago, it was, if you're this age, do this. And that was for all of these cancers, colorectal, lung, uh, breast. And what we have really tried to do with this work is migrate, uh, not abandon if you're this age, but to add in risk factors. And we certainly heard all about that this morning. And so it does become more complex, but but I think um, the yields are much higher when we look at it the way uh, Dr. Galliano and Dr. Um, uh, Debbie um, did. And so um, I think... Uh, uh, that that's a key piece. And, and the other thing I'll just mention uh, while we uh, while while I have the floor is is that we realize that for primary care providers in particular, not just keeping this all straight, but having the time to actually do it correctly in the midst of all the other things that primary care uh, providers are um bombarded by is a challenge. And so we are working hard with our digital teams, with folks from the um, electronic health records for Cerner, Epic, and all scripts to build in workflows that help people get screening done appropriately at the appropriate time and looking at risk factors. There's something called automated robotic processing, which is currently uh, in use in the Pacific Northwest and in Omaha uh, for colorectal cancer screening. And in the Pacific Northwest, they also have started with lung and I think they're moving in that direction in Omaha. Those are they, These are ways that actually we can use a bit of artificial intelligence since that seems to be the thing these days um, to look at records uh, evaluate patient's risk, which is why it's important to have the correct patient uh, and family history in the chart uh, and make recommendations for us. So I'm going to pause there, but both of those things, risk, 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 um, and automation are our focuses around this project. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Greenzeig. Um, so I know there's been a couple of questions in from our audience members to asking to clarify when it comes to young adult cancers um, or um, exposure to chemotherapy, what should be our approach? Um, how do you think about it? And can you like elucidate a little bit more around it? So I'll go to Dr. Krishnamurthy and then I'll just go to Dr. Galliano. So when we look at the NCCN guidelines for colorectal cancer screening, it just says chemotherapy, it doesn't specify alkylating chemotherapy, but now we understand from the therapy associated polyposis literature that's coming out that the alkylating chemotherapy has the highest risk of causing the mutations in the APC gene that then predisposes people to these, uh, you know, colorectal cancers when they have been exposed to chemotherapy. It's very hard in my practice, at least to get the details of the chemotherapy regimen that people might have received as a you know young adult or child. So uh, in the interest of caution and following the NCCN guidelines, we recommend to follow the guidelines for any chemotherapy. Dr. Galliano, what's your thought? Yeah, I think the best data is on achalating chemotherapy, but it probably is, is reasonable at this point in time. Remember, this is the first time uh, a year ago, this was not in the guidelines anywhere. This is the first time we're really understanding and recognizing this risk. And so it's childhood, adolescent, and young adult, meaning that goes all the way up to age 39. So that's a big swath of, of humanity. And Dr. Emmanuel actually may be able to comment on, because a lot of these things that people are getting on are for hematologic malignancies. Um, but certainly, um, it's a clearer in radiation therapy and the radiation uh, effect, if it's outside of the abdomen or pelvis, uh, that's not really a risk factor uh, for us. Or if it's a cancer with, with neither chemotherapy nor abdominal pelvic radiation, those are average risk patients from our current understanding. Dr. Emanuel? Yeah, so remember that uh, childhood cancer survivors, and we have to extrapolate because this goes all the way up to age 40. So it's not just childhood, but the the vast majority of childhood cancer survivors will be children that have had hemologic malignancies, as well as potentially patients who have had, you know, Wilms tumor, neuroblastomas, and things like that. Um, so that Right now, at least, because they've only been in the guidelines for a year, we're not differentiating out certain forms of chemotherapy uh, 
Um, as, as Dr. Debbie said, it may be hard to go back. The patient and the family may not remember or know what kind of chemotherapy they got 17 years ago. Uh, may be hard to track that down. So better part of uh, you know, de devil's advocate, just get, get them screened. They're childhood cancer survivors. They've been beat up. They've been through it. They're cured. We certainly don't want to get them over all that and then have them develop a colorectal cancer. So just get screened. I think the other big thing to remember, especially amongst the childhood cancer survivors that had uh, hemologic malignancies is the total body radiation. So even though they didn't have radiation directed at the pelvis, if they had total body radiation, usually that's associated with a stem cell transplant but total body radiation means that their pelvic area did get radiated and you need to have them in that screening thing. There won't be a lot of other childhood cancer survivors apart from maybe some sarcomas and maybe select other cancers that actually had direct uh, pelvic radiation, but you have to keep in mind the, the total body radiation group. I think it, it speaks to a lot of the work undergoing around cancer survivorship and that cancer survivorship starts the day you get diagnosed with cancer and then you move along with the hopes that we're tracking those outcomes. So thank you. Um, there was another question in the chat um, that I'm really interested to know from each of you. Aspirin use and colorectal cancer prevention. Uh, what are your thoughts? Because there's lots of studies out there. Some say, yes, there's prevention possibility there, but only in a specific age versus others that are saying it's sort of all over the place. What do you guys think about it? So I'll, I'll take that one on, um, unless anybody else wants to address it. The, the real, real clear data is in patients who are Lynch syndrome cohort patients who currently will take aspirin and they have to take it for at least five, uh, but more likely 10 years before they start to see a benefit. Uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, a guru in work on trying to reduce um, uh, formation of colorectal polyps, he, uh, uh, Peter Lance uh, had you know a lot of studies that we were trying to do. And what we found out in the people who are um, polyposis type patients is we could reduce the number of polyps but we didn't eliminate it and we're not sure that it made a huge benefit on mortality. Um, they do recommend now also considering uh, aspirin use in people who've had uh, a colorectal cancer uh, as one of the things you can do speaking to your very eloquent uh, spiel on the, um, the survivorship, right? So if you have um, a cardiovascular risk and this, shared decision-making is a reasonable thing to do, right? Um, if you have, if you look at aspirin use again for time, you have improved cancer survival um, and overall survival with use of aspirin. But we're really not, we're really not clear that as just a routine basis, everybody should be on uh, low dose aspirin. And when we're talking about this, just to be clear, it's not, it's 81 milligram, mm -hmm. you know, baby aspirin, not 325 standard uh, aspirin use. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is coming from our previous discussion around, you know, what is, what is the next frontier for colorectal screening? Because we know that getting screening sometimes can be quite a barrier, convincing our patients, take the day off, go get your colonoscopy, or, you know, like, I really need you to send back that stool card, or, you know, one of the multiple Cologuard boxes that are in your home, just send them back to us. Um, what's the next frontier, frontier um, or maybe things that are already here? Um, one thing I wanted to, a big shout out to Dr. Gray, who shared our, a great article from last month on RNA stool-based testing, um, showing some promising results on colorectal cancer detection. So I will do Dr. Emmanuel, Dr. Christian Murthy, and then Dr. Galliano in that order. So I guess I would preface this that, that uh, things are coming, but they're not here yet. 
And so that until they're here, the emphasis is just get screened by whatever way you can convince the patients to get screened because compared to mammography rates and for breast cancer screening, our colorectal screening rates are way, way, way too low, regardless of risk, regardless of anything else. So until the newer ones get here, just pick a method and get screened. Now, beyond that, what's coming down the road and is it going to be here in a year? Is it going to be here in three years, five? Don't know, but there are lots of things under development. The RNA uh, 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 stool base that Dr. Sagar is probably the closest uh, to being in prime time, but certainly we're looking at liquid biopsies uh, in the peripheral blood. Not here yet, but on their way. So there are going to be better ways um, less invasive, less intrusive for patients, not here yet. Uh, and until they do, just keep getting some kind of screening. Okay. I agree with Dr. Emmanuel. I think he um, said it very well when he said that the best screening test is the one that gets done. I'm excited about all these developments, but also you know, how we are able to create these algorithms and blend it into our EMR so that it becomes seamless, both the recommendation of starting and follow-up colonoscopy. So maybe our primary cares don't have to go in and figure out how many polyps, at what interval, what kind of polyps, because you know it's overwhelming the amount of things that people have to do. And this is one thing that maybe we can use our EMR and artificial intelligence to help streamline it. Um, I'm also excited about all these other new tests that are coming up, but until they are here and part of the guidelines, maybe it's probably not something that we want to really discuss here today. Well, again, the question is what's on the horizon? So the guidelines that we discuss and use are all level 2A or better data. Um, and and there are, however, something that's here now um, that we don't know how to use appropriately. So it's a methyl septin 9 DNA. It's already FDA approved. It's indicated for patients who refuse all other appropriate forms of colorectal cancer screening that you can use. And it, the hope would be that if something triggers and it's positive, um, it would lead the person on to, um, you know, likely at that point in time, colonoscopy, uh, which is your only uh, really a, a recommended screening modality for anyone other than high risk. Uh, the liquid biopsy and other things like that are being thought of. We're still trying to figure out how to really use those, you know, circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA that we can extract in peripheral blood and figure out how to use it in the setting of colorectal cancer and colorectal uh, cancer recurrence. So we're sure not ready for uh, assessing that in terms of uh, screening. But, you know, hopefully with time, this will come. Uh, and it may actually change our understanding of a lot of diseases about when some of these diseases we think that are local are actually systemic. And, you know, it could be a change for us to, to change our whole paradigm around some of these other cancers as we're able to use uh, other molecular or cellular technologies to help us make these diagnoses. Great. I'll bring it back to you, Dr. Greenswag. What are your thoughts about the future and where we're going? And then we can wrap it up. I'll give you the um, floor. Uh, I, th I think in terms of where we're going, we've just heard from three experts. So I'll, I'll rest my case there. But I, I think in the meantime, the future is not here. And so we need to keep going the direction that we are. But 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 certainly all of these things are part of the future, in, in, including um, using some intelligence about how we, how we do this. But uh, so I want to uh, bring this meeting to a close. And first of all, thank our panelists uh, and our speakers. Uh, we were worried, and I, I know the speakers know this, like, can we really get through all of this information in 45 minutes? And so you have exceeded our expectations uh, and did it. Uh, we, we thought, oh, this will be, it'll be 8.30 and we'll be still talking. But no, we didn't really say that. But, but, but I think you really sort of summarized it and we really appreciate it. Um, I, I, there were lots of questions and I, I think it's it's because of the quality of, of the information and and people's engagement around this topic. And so uh, we, we, we do think this is a great um, uh, talk and we really appreciate it. One thing uh, we were chatting, uh, 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 you know, chatting um, 
uh, is I think that as we begin this work, we will track the improvements that we have in colon cancer screening as a percent, uh, and we will use that to calculate uh, number of cancers prevented and number of deaths prevented. We've done that work with hypertension. It's substantial in terms of the number of people that we've turned around, the number of cardiovascular incidents, the number of deaths. I think we're at 1,200 deaths that we've prevented in, in the last three or four years. So similar here, I, I think that is a great message. And I think sometimes we lose uh, the real reason that we do this, like, hey, let's hit the goal and get a lot of people screened but it's really changing lives for the, for these patients, uh, having them have a life that's not complicated by comorbidities, disabilities, uh, lots of birthdays and those kinds of things. So, so uh, we thank you all. Um, uh, thank our guests, um, the, uh, our team that puts this together, uh, Dr. Sagar, John, Rachel, myself, and others. Uh, it's, it's a big job, and um, but we just see it yield um, uh, great benefits on a number of levels. So again, uh, it's Friday, and not only that, it's uh, Thanksgiving next week. So we hope people have a restful and safe weekend and a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday with you and yours uh, coming up. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. <music>